Hello and welcome to Safe Pasture. My name is Sherry Hammers and we are continuing on in our Jesus Our High Priest series in the book called The Holiest of All by Andrew Murray. Today we are starting on chapter 79. Wow, 79. The Sanctified Perfected Forever. Andrew starts off with Hebrews 10:14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He starts off the chapter with that same scripture. He says, By one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. We find here five of the most important words that occur in the epistle. And he's talking about the epistle of the Hebrews because that's what this entire book is an exposition of. It says, Sanctified. Sanctified is cleansed from sin taken out of the sphere and power of the world and sin, and brought to live in the sphere and power of God's holiest holiness in the holiest of all. So sanctification, and actually later on, I don't even know if it'll be in this series. There's another series I'm planning. I'm reading, studying another book by Andrew where he really delineates the difference between cleansing and sanctification and I, just like probably most people, thought that those were synonyms. I, I've heard people use them interchangeably when talking about biblical topics. And, you know, sanctified is being cleansed from sin. So it does involve cleansing, but it goes further than just merely being cleansed. Um, it says, taken out of the power of sin. I'm sorry, the power of the world and sin. Remember, and gosh, I don't remember where this is at. I think it's in Revelation where God says, come out of her, my people. If we could put that scripture up. It talks about, it's talking about the whole system of Babylon. It's talking about the, the harlot. It's talking about the Babylonian system that is the uh, antithesis of the bride of Christ. And when we are taken out of that system, we are getting, we're moving out of that sphere of that system, like this atmosphere around us that uh, of the Babylonian world system. And we're being taken out of the power of the world and the power of sin. Now, I know a lot of people think that this is just, we're supposed to be getting out physically from the, the Babylonian system. And while I'm, while I'm not disagreeing with that, I want to say there's so many, so much more that God is talking about when he talks about coming out of Babylon. And that really ties in with sanctification. And I was, uh, I, I put a little note here about the sphere. Think of it as the atmosphere, as the air you breathe spiritually. So what is the air you're breathing spiritually? Is it completely saturated with the word of God? Is it saturated with thoughts of God and his presence? Or are you just walking around, <clears throat> excuse me, being completely impacted by the world? Are you watching the, the mass media? Are you getting your news from God or, for, um, or from the world system? Are you looking for feedback for who you should be? Are you looking from God's word? Are you, or are you looking from the world? Because it's so easy on social media to get caught up in how much attention you're getting, what kind of attention you're getting. And we kind of start to think like, if everybody around me thinks I'm okay, then I must be okay. And, you know, I heard someone say a long time ago that you got to remember that people of the world, they're down in the ditch. You know, you might be walking on the the path of righteousness and they're down in the ditch and their goal is to not usually is not to come up to you without some prodding of the Holy Spirit of course I'm not saying that can happen but I'm saying if you hang around with these kind of people they will more likely pull you into the ditch with them I mean there's a common um, saying right now but it's actually I don't know if people know it's actually based on the word that talks about you know you need to look at the five people that you hang around with the most and you become like those five people that you hang around with the most but actually the Bible says the evil communications corrupt good manners so God already covered that you're going to become like the people that are around you and if those people are full of the world and not God 
then that's going to pull you in the wrong direction. Another word he says here is forever. He hath perfected us once for all and forever, which if you watch the last video, we that was what the chapter was about. By sacrifice, the death, the blood, the sacrifice of Christ in the power by which we have been alike sanctified and perfected. So the sacrifice sanctifies us, it perfects us, and that's that's one of the um, things that it says by the one offering he hath perfected them by um, I'm sorry perfected them that are sanctified so sanctified and perfected we are cleaned up and put back together I, this is my little note but we are cleaned up and put back together in restoration back to God's original plan let me just back up here again to the um, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So he's not saying that these words, like the word sacrifice, doesn't appear in that little verse eighteen or verse fourteen. But he's saying that these are common themes throughout the epistle of the Hebrews. Now he says by one sacrifice, one because there is none other needed either by others or himself. So even God Himself does not have to provide another sacrifice. Jesus completely redeemed us and sanctified us in the sacrifice of himself. That's the only sacrifice through eternity that will ever be needed to redeem us from sin. He says, one divine and therefore sufficient and forever. So the fact that he was divine and man, that was the perfect, that was the perfect combination. Actually, nothing else could have done it. He says, the chief thought of the passage is, he hath forever perfected them that are being sanctified. The words in verse 10, in which will we have been sanctified, speak of our sanctification as an accomplished fact, like it's a past tense. We are saints, holy in Christ, in virtue of our real union with him and his holy life planted in the center of our being. I'm going to repeat that because I think that for most of us, our experience is, we walk around in life, we get little dings from the world, we get, we fall into temptation, we seem to mess up all the time. We tell God, I'm never going to do that again, and then we do it again. You know, I'm never, I, I, God, you just fell in the mud puddle, God just cleaned you up, and you say, I'll never do it again, and then you turn around and you fall in the mud puddle again, right? I mean, how many of you out there can relate to, to that's the way I've, I've seen things in my life, I just think, God, I can't believe I did that again. I got in the flesh again. I, I, I took the bait. The Satan put some bait out for me and I just took it, hook, line, and sinker. But he says, our sanctification is spoken of as an accomplished fact, as a true reality. He says, we are saints. We are the set apart ones. We are holy in Christ, not holy of ourselves, but holy in Christ in virtue of our real union with him. So in this earthly world, when we get our mind off of spiritual things and we get it onto this world that we're supposed to be sanctified away from, we lose sight of our real union with him. And we lose sight of who he says we are. And he says his holy life planted in the center of our being. Um, that, that, that phrasing right there just reminds me real quick, little side note. If you've never read Hind's Feet on High Places uh, by Hannah Hennard, it's, it's just a Christian classic. I mean, it's, it's another analogy. It's a similar analogy to Pilgrim's Progress, but it's, there's a lot. She takes it a different, kind of a different way. And, and when you read Pilgrim's Progress, you get this certain thing out of it. And when you read Heinz Feet on High Places, there's another aspect that you get out of that. And one of the things in um, Heinz Feet on High Places is the main character whose name is Much Afraid. The shepherd, the good shepherd, he plants this thorn in her heart. And he tells her it's painful at first, but it will grow just continue continue to walk after the shepherd and this will grow into a beautiful flower and it will it will pretty much take over every aspect of your life and it just makes me think of that that he planted his holy life that's what that that's what that is in that book 
His holy life is planted in the center of our being. All right, so Andrew says in chapters, he's talking about Hebrews here, in chapters 9, 9, and 10, 1, we read that the sacrifices could never, as touching the conscience, make the worshiper perfect. So the the under the Old Testament, under the Levitical priesthood, the blood sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, they could never touch the conscience. They could never make the worshiper perfect. They never make perfect them that draw nigh so that they have no more conscience of sin. He says, our conscience is that which defines what our consciousness of ourselves before God should be. So when your conscience tells you, you, you were horrible to that person and you're guilty, you have not, you've not repented of that, you've not asked them to forgive you, and so you, you need to get this right. You're not in right standing with God and that other person right now. And I think he's right. So our conscience is telling us this is your stance before God. This is, this is in real time, this is your current <laughs> status, your current update. And he says, Christ makes the worshiper perfect as touching the conscience so that there is no more conscience of sins. So when you are right with God, that blood, that sacrifice makes your conscience right with God. He says, having, he goes on back to the scripture, having offered up prayer and having been heard for his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by what he suffered and was made perfect. And Andrew says, in his death, he accomplished a threefold work. He perfected himself, his own human nature and character. He perfected our redemption perfectly putting away sin from the place it had in heaven. That's in Hebrews 9.23. So he perfected our redemption. And, oh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. He perfected our redemption, perfectly putting away sin from the place it had in heaven and in our hearts. And then the third thing is he perfected us, taking us up into his own perfection and making us partakers of that perfect human nature. So he, he lets us partake of what it would be like to have lived in this world where, where sin wasn't present, where we weren't walking around um, letting the flesh dictate sin in our lives. He says, which in suffering and obedience in the body prepared for him and the will of God done in it, he had wrought out for us. So in other words, Jesus, even though he was born into this sin cursed world, you know, into this fallen nature, in his fallen, just everything's fallen. He was born into this in a human body because God prepared a body for him. And he did the will of God through suffering, through obedience, and he he created, he prepared and completed this perfect human nature for us. He showed us, he demonstrated, this is how a person in this human body can live in this world without sin. That's just incredible. Christ himself is our perfection. In him, it is complete. Abiding in him continually is perfection. So when we abide in him, we get to partake of perfect human nature. You ever thought about that? When we abide in him, we're getting to see how to live this life right now, not in the sweet by and by, not when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. And it's going to be a great day. But right now in the, in the, you know, in the nitty gritty of this world, he is saying, you can live this perfect human life because I can, I, I've done it and I'm giving you the power to do it. And I put a little note here just in summary of that. He did the will of God perfectly in the body. And it was a body just like ours. He felt pain just like us. He, When it was hot, he was sweaty just like us. When he, when it was cold, he was, he was uncomfortably cold just like us. Um, but he still did not give in to the flesh. Andrew quotes again from Hebrews. Let us press on to perfection. He says, here is our goal. Christ, by one offering, 
hath perfected us forever. It is the walk in this path of perfection which as our leader he opened up in doing the will of God, which is the new and living way into the holiest. So the way, this is my little note here, but the way into the holiest is the path to perfection, of perfection. One sacrifice forever, we perfected forever, and he who did it all, he forever seated on the throne, our blessed priest king, he lives to make it all ours in the power of an endless life in which he offered himself unto God, in which he entered the holiest. He now lives to give and be in our hearts all he hath accomplished. So everything that Jesus was able to accomplish, he wants to live that out in you and me. He wants us to allow him because when, when we submit to him, we are making way. We're getting out of the way and we're saying, live your life through me. That is God's goal. Remember, John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. Like, we need to take stock of our own lives and go, okay, so how, what percentage, you know, just a ballpark percentage, does God get to dictate my life? And what percentage am I still in control of? Because we need to work on we need to keep going and going. And he's uh, heard someone say, I don't know that we need to creep along like this, but you know, they say, you know, if you're 1% better than you were yesterday, that's progress. Well, we need to get that percentage going up for God and down for our flesh in our own wa uh, walk in this earth. Um, okay, he says, what more can we need? What more can we need than the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit living out his life through us? And the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts. I'm just adding all that in. But he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. I just want to remind you um, that those words, consider Jesus. In a previous episode, I right now couldn't even tell you. It was, it was maybe in the 30s or 40s uh, uh, chapter numbers. But there was one that was entitled, Consider Jesus. And he talked about... Andrew did about the entomology of the word consider. And he was talking about how th that word actually came from when astrologers would look, I'm sorry, astronomers would look at the stars and they're gazing at the stars, right? They're studying the stars. And that word consider comes from that gaze being lifted up to the heavens and studying and trying to understand that's what the way we need to live our lives we need to have our eyes lifted to heaven and really focused with intensity on jesus and i'll just throw in one little note i had at the end of the chapter everything jesus did in defeating the devil and the power of sin he wants us to live in that accomplishment well i hope this has blessed and inspired you today Please join me again next time and God bless.